Welcome to White Lecture Online. To my lecture online, what are hyperbolic functions? Well, the name in themselves. Now, what are they? Not so sure. Well, the name itself is kind of confusing because, no, the name is not confusing at all. Okay, so start it back. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about <laughs> hyperbolic <laughs> functions are usually very much, un oh man, I just can't talk. <sighs> Welcome to Electron Online. In this video, we're going to talk about hyperbolic functions. Now, hyperbolic functions are often misunderstood, and the reason for that is because we use symbolism for the function, such as the sine with an h behind it and the cosine with an h behind it, that makes it seem like they're like trigonometric functions. And even though there are similarities between the two, there's also quite a few differences. So let's talk about the similarities and the differences. Well, first of all, the trigonometric functions are related to the unit circle x squared plus y squared equals 1, where the hyperbolic functions are related to hyperbolas, and they're related to the equation x squared minus y squared equals 1, where the function goes right to the point here where x equals 1 when y is equal to 0. Now let's review the trigonometric functions so we can compare the two to one another. Well, first of all, if we pick up any point on the unit circle, that point will have an x and a y coordinate. The x coordinate is defined by the cosine of the angle between the x axis and the line connecting the origin to that point on the circle. So let's call that angle t. And so the x coordinate of that will then be cosine of t, and the y coordinate is called the sine of t, the sine of that angle t right there. Now, we also know that the x coordinate, which is equal to the cosine of t, can be defined as the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse of the triangle made from the origin to that point and aligned down to the x-axis here. So we'll look at this triangle here. We can say that the cosine of t is equal to the ratio of the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. In this case, the adjacent side would be the x-coordinate of that point and the hypotenuse would be the radius of the unit circle, which of course for a unit circle is equal to 1. The y-coordinate of that point on the circle is defined as the sine of t, which is by the definition equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. The opposite side would be the y-coordinate and the hypotenuse would be the radius of the circle. And again, with the unit circle, y, uh, r is equal to 1, so this becomes y over 1 or y equals y. So that makes a lot of sense. Now we're also going to relate the angle here to the area enclosed by the segment of the circle. So we can see, see here that S can represent the arc length of the circle from here to the point XY. And we know that this, that is defined by the radius of the circle times the angle in radians. So R times T would equal the length of this. And so we can see then, since the radius of the circle of a unit circle is equal to 1, the arc length is equal to the angle in radians. Then we can also calculate the area of the segment right here. The area is equal to the whole area of the circle times the ratio of the arc length divided by, of course, the entire circumference of the circle. So the arc length would be S and the circumference would be 2 pi r, so that ratio times the area of a whole circle equals the area of the segment. And then we realize that the pi's cancel out, one of the r's cancel out, and instead of s we can write t, so the area can be defined as r times t divided by 2, and of course realizing that again in the unit circle r equals 1, so area equals t over 2, or t equals 2 times the area. So with a, a unit circle, the angle t in radians is always equal to twice the area of the segment. You make the, the angle larger, the area becomes larger proportionally, so we can say that the area is proportional to the angle. And that's unique about the unit circle. Now when we go to the hyperbolic functions using this hyperbola here, again we can say that there's a point on the line here, we'll call that xy, it has xy coordinates, and the x coordinate is defined as the hyperbolic cosine of t. Sometimes we name that cosh t, however, it's probably better simply to call it the hyperbolic cosine of t. And then this here, the y-coordinate of that point on the line, is called the hyperbolic sine of t. 
Now, take a look at this area here created between the origin, the point on the line, and this point here where the line crosses the x-axis. So it's kind of the same as this area right here. Again, where the line crosses the x-axis. Here we have the, the line going up to the point and the origin. So we have a similar area there defined by the origin, where we are on the, on the line on the function, and where the function crosses the x-axis. So here's the x-axis, and there's the y-axis. Now, if we let t equals 2a, just like what we did over here, let t equals 2a, then you can see that the hyperbolic sine and the hyperbolic cosine could also be written as the hyperbolic sine of twice that area. So let's do that. So this hyperbolic sine of twice the area, and here we could write the hyperbolic cosine of twice the area. Now, what we don't have here, unlike what we have with trigonometric functions, there's no proportional relationship between the angle theta, let's, let's call it the angle theta here, and the area. So when we double the angle, that doesn't mean we double the area. There's no linear relationship between the two. We cannot say that the area is proportional to t, oh, let me change that not to t. We want to call that the angle theta. Let's write that. So we know the area is not proportional to the angle like it is over here with the trigonometric functions. Okay, so let's take a look now how things are related. Notice as the angle is zero, the area will be zero. So there, that's good. Just like it is over here when the angle is zero, the area will be zero. But then as the area increases, there will be a maximum angle we can have where otherwise we'll no longer reach a point on that hyperbola. In other words, since a hyperbola is asymptotically limited by the lines y equals x on the positive side and y equals minus x on the negative side, if the angle becomes larger than 45 degrees, we can no longer reach a point on that, on that function, on that line representing that function. So, what happens when the angle gets closer and closer and closer to 45 degrees? How big does this area become? Well, it turns out, as we reach an angle of 45 degrees or pi over 4, the area enclosed here will reach infinity. So, it's quite different from what we're used to seeing here, where we have that linear proportionality between the two. You may also wonder, well, how do I figure out the area? Because here, we can easily figure out the area on the unit circle, but how do we figure out the area over here? Well, we'll show that in the next few videos to come, but at least notice the relationship. We can see here that the functions sine of t and cosine of t are related where t is equal to twice the area, and here as well when we say the, the hyperbolic sine of t and the hyperbolic cosine of t, again that's related to twice the area. t will be 2a just like it is over here, however, finding the area will be a different kind of thing here. So that comes in the next videos. At least you can see the relationship. Here we use the unit circle x squared plus y squared equals 1. There we use the hyperbolic function x squared minus y squared equals 1 or the, or the function for the hyperbola x squared minus y squared equals 1. So there's the similarity and the differences between the two and we'll explore hyperbolic functions a little bit more over the next few videos before we start working with them. And that's how it's done.